Hello and welcome to this, the Scottish Wars of Independence. You join me just before kick-off in the year 1286. Things are hotting up between the contenders, the Kingdom of Scotland and the Kingdom of England. The Scots aren't in a great position considering their king, Alexander III, who held the country in a period of relative peace and economic stability, has just died falling off his horse, throwing the whole country into chaos. King Edward I of England is watching the situation carefully from the sidelines while also fighting in France. Oh, and that's some more bad luck for the Scots. Alexander's successor, his granddaughter, the Maid of Norway, has died en route to Scotland. And what's this? The Scots have asked Edward to arbitrate the decision of who should take the Scottish crown. A strange tactic indeed. Will Edward treat the situation fairly or will he use this to his advantage? The contenders for the crown and what is being termed the great cause are John Balliol, who has the strongest claim due to customary primogeniture, Robert Bruce and John Common. Edward has set up a court consisting of one-third English and two-thirds Scots nobles with himself as the head. And they have made a decision. John Balliol has been crowned King of Scotland. A tactful decision made by Edward, I'm sure, as Balliol is the most likely to swear fealty to Edward as his feudal overlord and essentially making Scotland a vassal state. I can't see this going down well among Scotland's political class. And they're off. It's now 1296. John Balliol and the Scottish forces have attacked Carlisle in Northern England after King Edward I of England demanded, as their feudal overlord, that Scotland join him in his war against the French. Balliol refused and instead made a treaty with the French. Oh, Edward is not happy with John Balliol and I would not like to be in his shoes right now. The Scottish assault on Carlisle was largely a failure, but now Edward has sent the Earl of Surrey marching north to Dunbar. Surrey's men are breaking formation to cross the spot burn, and it seems the Scots have mistaken this as the English leaving the field. Oh no, what a folly! The Scots are charging in a disorderly fashion, thinking this is a rout, but Surrey's men have regrouped and are returning the charge with a swift action. Not many Scots dead, but hundred lords, knights and men-at-arms, including John Common, have been captured. King Edward has himself made an appearance and Dunbar Castle has surrendered. Balliol is fleeing while Roxburgh Castle has fallen without a fight. Edinburgh Castle managed to hold out for a week. The entire Scottish lowlands are now in English hands. John Balliol has now surrendered himself, confessed to rebellion against Edward and abandoned the treaty with France. He's being unceremoniously stripped of his royal vestments and taken back to England along with the Stone of Destiny. Without a king, the country is being stripped of its identity and Edward is spending the rest of the year installing English lords throughout Scotland. It looks like the War of Independence may be over already. 1-0 to England. It looks like I've spoken too soon. Andrew Moray, a knight who escaped captivity after the Battle of Dunbar, has raised the royal standard of Scotland at Avoch formed a guerrilla army and is attacking English-held castles, already securing the northeast of the country. A new player has been drafted onto the field, a one Sir William Wallace, who's wasting no time and has killed Sir William Hazelrig, the English Sheriff of Lanark, much to the delight of the crowd. King Edward has sent North a force to resolve what he refers to as the Scottish problem. He says he is confident of victory and has recruited some Scottish nobles still loyal to him, including Robert the Bruce. I wonder how well that will work out for him. Robert the Bruce has defected to the rebels. The Scots are giving the English the runaround, but have finally met at Irvine and are negotiating. But I suspect this is to buy time for Wallace to train his men. Wallace and Moray have managed to recapture all but Dundee Castle, and who cares about Dundee anyway? There's only so much guerrilla fighting that can go on until things come to a head, and it looks like... Yes, it looks like the English and Scots armies are converging near Stirling Castle. The Scots have positioned themselves on Abbey Craig, overlooking the River Forth and Stirling Bridge. There's a standoff. It's lasting a few days. Now the English and Welsh infantry are crossing the bridge onto the flat land where the Scots are. They're just waiting. The bridge is so narrow only two horses can cross side by side. What are the Scots waiting for? The entire English army will have crossed if they don't do something. At last, the Scots spearmen are rapidly advancing from the higher ground, fending off a charge by the English heavy cavalry, counter-attacking the English infantry. They have now gained control of the east side of the bridge, cutting off any chance of English reinforcements to cross. The outnumbered English are caught on the low ground in the loop of the river with no chance of relief or retreat. They are being slaughtered. The Earl of Surrey and a small contingent of archers are still in a strong position south of the river. Is he going to stand firm and hold the line of the river forth, denying the Scots passage to the south? No, he's fleeing! The Scots have drawn even, one all, with Scotland free of the English for now. Unfortunately for the Scots, Andrew Moray has died of his injuries, but Wallace did manage to flay an English knight of his skin and make it into a strap for his sword. He's spending 1297 raiding, pillaging and burning 700 villages in northern England. It's one all already. 
12.98 is starting with the Scots on the back foot as King Edward I of England has just signed a truce with King Philip IV of France and Scotland has not been mentioned. This means Edward has no excuse not to wage war on Scotland again. It's now July and he's invading Scotland. Wallace's tactics are fairly simple since the Scots only have a fighting force of around 6,000 men and the English have 15,000. He's going to want to avoid a pitch battle at all costs. He's giving the English the runaround until they run out of supplies, hoping they'll withdraw. Unfortunately for Wallace, it looks like Edward has received intelligence that the Scots are a mere 13 miles away in Callander Woods, ready to pursue the retreating English. Edward was indeed about to retreat to Edinburgh, but is now quoted as saying, As God lives, they need not pursue me, for I will meet them this day. The Scots army, made up mostly of spearmen again, are arranged in four armoured shelterings, their long spears or pikes pointing outwards at various heights, bristling like a formidable hedgehog. Between the shelterings are archers and to the rear is a small troop of men-at-arms. The English cavalry are divided into four battalions, the left being commanded by the Earls of Norfolk, Hereford and Lincoln, the right by the Bishop of Durham and the King commanding the centre. The left have begun an immediate attack but have encountered a small marsh to the front of the Scots position and are making a long detour before being able to make contact with the right of Wallace's army. The right are holding back to give the king time to get into position, but the impatient knights have joined the fray. What a mess! But the cavalry have finally closed on the Scots from both flanks. The Scots bowmen stood their ground and have been quickly taken care of. The shelterings are holding firm, the English knights making little impression on the dense forest of long spears, and a small number of riders have been killed under their horses. King Edward has arrived just in time to witness the disarray of his cavalry and has quickly restored discipline. The Scottish light cavalry are charging the English heavy cavalry, but are completely outnumbered. They've been absolutely slaughtered. Edward's longbowmen now being brought into place, and they have quickly overcome the inexperienced force of the poorly armed Scottish archers. The shelterings are an easy target, they are defenceless and have nowhere to hide. The Scots are unable to retreat or attack. It seems the battle was lost almost as soon as the first arrows began to fall. The English cavalry are behaving this time, waiting on the King's command to penetrate the Scottish formation once the Scots ranks are thin enough. The English foot soldiers are now closing in to mop up the scattering shelterings. A crushing defeat for the Scots at the Battle of Falkirk, although William Wallace managed to escape as the Scots were caught with their pants down, if they even wore any. England 2, Scotland 1. Wallace, defeated, has resigned as Guardian of Scotland and has been sent to the continent to drum up support for the Scottish cause. In his absence, it looks like Robert Bruce and John Cummin have both been made Guardians, but they keep arguing among themselves. King Edward of England has been condemned by the Pope for the Battle of Falkirk and told to negotiate with the Scots. He is choosing to ignore the Pope and has invaded southwest Scotland, Bruce country. He's managed to take Caverlock Castle, but is now withdrawn with a truce due to inaction. The Scots are as disorganised as ever. Bruce and Common have both resigned as guardians and have been replaced by true patriot Sir John de Sulis. Hopefully he fares better as King Edward, along with his son, also Edward, have invaded Scotland once more. One is taking the east and the other the west, both enjoying moderate success, but evading the Scots army for the most part. Oh, and here's a turn up for the books. Robert the Bruce has submitted to King Edward I of England once more, saying he doesn't want to sack sacrifice more people for the Balliol cause, especially now that Balliol is comfortably enjoying exile in Rome. King Edward has agreed to a nine-month truce with the Scots, but France and the Vatican have dropped all support for Scotland. This is a terrible blow for the independence cause. The nine-month truce now having ended, Edward has sent Sir John Seagrave on a reconnaissance mission and to take some lesser strongholds. The Scots met Seagrave's forces at Roslyn and they've done it! They've managed to defeat the English force, equalising two all at the Battle of Roslyn. France has now made peace with England, meaning they will not come to Scotland's aid should Edward invade again. Edward is invading Scotland again, with occasional skirmishes from Wallace. It's now 1304 and the English are sending raiding parties into the lowlands of Scotland, putting William Wallace's forces to flight. Sir John Seagrave is about to get his revenge on the Scots at the Battle of Hapru, a small affair involving just a few hundred men, but the English have won, sending William Wallace once again into hiding. England 3, Scotland 2. Meanwhile, Edward is at Stirling Castle and, despite the occupant's offer of unconditional surrender, is using his new trebuchet to destroy it. How can the Scots recover? Oh, they aren't. They've given up. Every lord and noble in Scotland has submitted to Edward, except Wallace. Edward is now amalgamating Scotland into England, while Robert the Bruce and Bishop William Lamberton are secretly making a pact against the English, biding their time, waiting for Edward to die of old age. A bold, if lengthy, strategy. Oh dear, another blow for Scotland. 
William Wallace has been captured and executed as a traitor, being hanged, drawn and quartered, his head placed upon a spike on London Bridge and his limbs sent to other cities. John Common has told King Edward about Bruce and Lamberton's pact. This isn't going to end well. Yep, just as I suspected, Bruce has stabbed John Common. He now has two choices, forever be a fugitive or fight. There hasn't been a King of Scotland for ten years, but now Robert has been crowned King based on his support from the Church in defiance of the Pope. Yes, it's 1306 and Scotland has a King once more. Edward isn't wasting any time and has sent Aymer de Valence, 2nd Earl of Pembroke, to Perth to meet with Bruce's forces, with the order of no mercy. Anyone captured alive is to be executed without trial. It seems Bruce is unaware of Edward's intentions as he's acting in accordance with chivalric traditions, calling on de Valence to come out of the safety of Perth's walls and do battle. De Valence, usually an honourable man, has told Bruce that it's too late in the day and will accept the challenge tomorrow. But now that Bruce and his forces are settling down for the night, de Valence is sneaking his men out of Perth for a night assault. A most ungentlemanly approach. The English are slaughtering the unarmed Scots and they have no way of defending themselves. King Robert the Bruce has managed to unhorse the balance and escape with a small force of knights, but around 4,000 Scots have been massacred or captured awaiting execution at the Battle of Methven. England 4, Scotland 2. To make matters worse, the small Scots army, around 500 people or so, have wandered into MacDougall territory, Clan MacDougall being allies with Clan Common and the English. The MacDougalls have attacked the hapless king and his followers, further diminishing their numbers and setting them to flight. King Robert the Bruce is a fugitive from both domestic and foreign enemies and has sent his family to kill Drummy Castle in Aberdeenshire for safety. Bruce is spending the winter in hiding and may have had an apocryphal encounter with a spider. It's February 1307 and Bruce has landed near Turnbury in his own earldom. I doubt he'll be playing at Donald Trump's golf course. He's managed to take the town of Turnbury, killing many of the English who were garrisoned there. Bruce's younger brothers have landed further south in Galloway with an army of Irishmen, but have been defeated by Dungal McDowell, who is a fervent supporter of John Balliol. Remember him? It's now April and the Scots and English are finally meeting for another engagement. Has Bruce learned from his past mistakes? It looks like he has, as he sent a raiding party to the English camp, drawing them towards where the Scots are encamped at Glen Truel. He's using the terrain to his advantage and has ambushed the English who are marching around the loch in the glen in single file, pushing great granite boulders down the steep slopes to hinder their progress and squash some. The English can't manoeuvre and have lost several hundred cavalry, withdrawing as quickly as they can. That's the Battle of Glen Truel, England 4, Scotland 3. This kind of tactic favours the Scots and puts the English at a disadvantage, as we're about to see at the Battle of Loudon Hill. It's 600 Scots against 3,000 English. Aymer de Valence is on his way, commanding the main English force in the area. Bruce is taking up a position on a plain south of Loudon Hill, some 500 yards wide and bounded on either side by a deep morass. Bruce is scouting the ground, making the necessary preparations, including digging trenches, forcing De Valence to charge his horses through a bog, forcing attack along a narrowly constricted front upwards towards the waiting Scottish spears. It's an effective tactic. The Scots are slaughtering the knights, sending the rear ranks fleeing in panic. Scotland have drawn even for all. Another blow to the English as King Edward I of England has died and is replaced by his far less competent son, Edward II. Edward II is less interested with Scotland for now and Bruce is spending the next few years ejecting the English from Scotland and demanding that Balliol supporters acknowledge Bruce as king or else they'll lose their lands. I'm just, yes, I'm just getting word that during this time Bruce's family at Kildrummy Castle have been captured and imprisoned in England. The Scots now have around 6,000 fighting men of their own. Once again, the fighting is being centred around Stirling Castle, with the Scots besieging it in an attempt to throw the English out of Scotland once and for all. It looks as though Edward II is finally taking note of what is happening north of the border and has ordered an army of 25,000 to invade Scotland. The battle site has been chosen in a field south of Stirling, through which the Bannock Burn flows. That's called foreshadowing. It's 23rd of June 1314 and two English cavalry formations are advancing towards the three Scottish Sultrans. A knight named Henry de Boone has charged at Robert the Bruce. Bruce is coming straight for him and, oh my god, Bruce has split de Boone's head in two with a single blow from his axe. The rest of the Sultran commanded by Bruce are chasing down the English cavalry formation who are retreating back across the burn. Robert Clifford and Henry de Beaumont, with 300 men-at-arms, are making a circuit towards Stirling Castle, keeping the open ground. Bruce's nephew, Thomas Randolph, 1st Earl of Moray, leader of the Scottish advance guard, hearing that his uncle has repulsed the advance guard of the English on the other side of the wood, is marching across the open ground towards Clifford and de Beaumont. 
The Scots have utterly routed the English squadron. Some English are fleeing to the castle, others to Edward's army, which has already left the field and has set up camp on a plain near the River Forth beyond Bannockburn. Thomas Gray the Younger describes it as an evil, deep, wet marsh where the English army unharnessed and remained all night having sadly lost confidence and being too much disaffected by the events of the day. This is most unusual as battles of this period tend to be short affairs, usually only lasting a few hours at most, but it looks like the Battle of Bannockburn is to go on for a second day. Alexander Seaton, a Scottish knight, has defected from the English camp and told Bruce that English morale is low, encouraging him to attack. The Scots are advancing from New Park. It's not long after daybreak. Edward, looking surprised to see Scots pikemen advancing towards his position, emerging from the cover of the woods. Bruce's army have paused and knelt in prayer. Edward is reported as saying in surprise, they pray for mercy, as one of his attendants replied, for mercy, yes, but from God, not you, these men will conquer or die. Strong words there, showing how low morale is for the English, despite their vastly superior numbers. On the English side, the Earl of Gloucester and Earl of Hereford are arguing over who should lead the vanguard into battle. Gloucester is reported to have tried to persuade the king to postpone the battle entirely. Edward II accused him of cowardice and, goaded by the accusation, the Earl of Gloucester has advanced to meet the Scots. Few English soldiers have accompanied Gloucester and, well, the Scots have made light work of him. The English are gradually being pushed back and ground down by the Scots Shelterns. English longbowmen are attempting to support the advance of the knights but are shooting their own men and have been ordered to stop. The English and Welsh longbowmen have been deployed to flank the advancing Scots and they have already been dispersed by 500 Scottish cavalry. The English cavalry, meanwhile, are hemmed in against the Bannockburn. They can't manoeuvre. They've broken rank. Aymer de Valence and Giles d'Argentan, reputedly the third best knight in Europe, have seized the reins of King Edward's horse, dragging him away, closely followed by 500 knights of the royal bodyguard, insisting that the battle is lost. D'Argentan is reported as saying to the king, Sire, your protection was committed to me, but since you are safely on your way, I will bid you farewell, for never yet have I fled from a battle, nor will I now. He's turned his horse to charge back into the ranks of the Scots, who have quickly slain him. Panic is spreading among the remaining English troops, their defeat has turned into a rout. Edward has fled to Dunbar Castle and took a ship to Berwick. The rest of his army are trying to escape the safety of the English border 90 miles south but are being picked off by the pursuing Scottish army and the inhabitants of the Scottish countryside. What a humiliating defeat for England. Their forces were three times that of the Scots but poor leadership and communication has led to around 11,000 English infantry being killed. Scotland 5, England 4. Since the Battle of Bannockburn, Bruce's family have been released in return for English prisoners and Robert the Bruce's brother, Edward Bruce, has invaded Ireland to stick it to the English some more and... Oh, uh, he's dead, never mind, that's that then. The Scots and English have resumed their usual raiding in the borders, culminating in the Battle of Skate Muir near Coldstream in February 1316. Led by Sir James the Black Douglas, the Scots butchered an English raiding party from Berwick who were on the brink of starvation after a failed harvest. Douglas commented it was the toughest fight of his career. The ref has, yes, the ref has awarded a point to Scotland despite this being more of a skirmish than a battle. Scotland 6, England 4. Speaking of Berwick, it looks like there's trouble afoot there once more. It is the last English stronghold in Scotland and is being besieged by the Black Douglas and Sir Walter Stuart, Robert the Bruce's brother-in-law and father of future King Robert II, the first Stuart King of Scotland. Bruce had already attempted to take Berwick in winter 1317 but withdrew. Now it's April 1318 and the Scots are having much more luck. They've managed to bribe an English sergeant to allow a party of Scots to climb the town wall. They're over and running amok in the town of Berwick and after some street fighting they've taken it. All that remains is the castle. King Robert the Bruce has appeared with an army. I wish I could say things are about to get interesting, but actually an 11 week siege that ends with the English surrendering due to the lack of supplies and being expelled from the country is a bit underwhelming. It does however mean that Scotland are completely free of the English. Although the English will recapture Berwick again in 1482 and it will forever remain in their hands as part of England. At least their football team will be able to play in the Scottish League though. Scotland 7, England 4. King Edward II of England has been too preoccupied with the political struggles with his barons to pay any heed to the raiding happening in the north of England, but is less than impressed by the fall of Berwick and is on his way to Scotland to claim it back. His sizeable army are heading north and have stopped via York to drop off Queen Isabella of England. They're attacking Berwick from land and sea, but the handy upgrades the castle received while under occupation by the English are holding out very well under the command of Sir Walter Stuart. 
Bruce knows he won't be as lucky as he was at Bannockburn, so he's trying a different tactic. He's going to England. He's heading to York, where the Queen is in residence, raiding and burning villages as he goes. The Queen has escaped from York, which should be a medieval John Carpenter movie, and is safe in Nottingham. York is largely undefended, but it looks like the Archbishop has set up an army of clergymen in an attempt to drive out the Scots. Around 4,000 men of the cloth have been slain in the Battle of Mighton. Meanwhile in Berwick, a rift has appeared in the English army as many barons, already in disagreement with King Edward, have abandoned the siege to protect their lands currently being ravaged by the Bruce. The English have given up and are returning home, James Douglas following close behind and raiding northern English villages once more. So bad is the defeat that Edward is asking for a truce, which Bruce has given. Scotland 8, England 4. It's now 1320 and the Pope has excommunicated Bruce and in response he and the Scottish aristocracy have written the Declaration of Our Broth, which includes the immortal lines While a hundred of us remain alive, we will not submit in the slightest measure to the domination of the English. We do not fight for honour, riches or glory, but solely for the freedom which no true man gives up but with his life. Powerful stuff. Meanwhile the truce with England has expired. The Scots are raiding the north of England with renewed aplomb trying to goad Edward away from the potential civil war he's facing. It's worked! The Great Raid of 1322, where Bruce's men penetrated 100 miles south into England, has drawn an English force to face the Scots. Edward II of England has defeated his barons and is in high spirits, confident of victory. He has invaded Scotland, but the Scots are nowhere to be seen. Bruce and his men have destroyed the harvest and removed livestock so the English have no food other than what they carried north with them. Their morale crushed, they are retreating back to England, destroying abbeys on their way. The Scots are aware that the English are starving and retreating, and are preparing a sneak attack on Scott and Moor in Yorkshire, where the English army are camped under the charge of the Earl of Richmond. The Battle of Old Byland is looking to be an easy victory for the Scots, as the main force charge uphill towards the malnourished English, while the Highlanders are descending from the cliffs at the rear. Resistance has crumbled, it's another rout! Edward, hiding in the nearby Revo Abbey, has been forced to flee, leaving his possessions behind. How undignified. That's 9-4 to Scotland. In 1326, the Scots renewed the old alliance with France, and the following year, Edward II was forced to abdicate after being imprisoned, his son, also Edward, becoming King of England. It's not long before Edward III has to face the Scots after truce negotiations broke down. The two armies have met at Stanhope Park in County Durham, North East England. The Scots are giving the English the runaround. Somehow they have managed to lose the entire Scots army. Instead of pursuing, the English have sent out scouts. One has been captured by the Scots and has been sent back to the English with their location. The Scots have taken up a very good defensive position on the River Weir, one which the English can't attack. Some minor skirmishing between men at arms and archers, but nothing major. There's a standoff. The Scots have decided to attack at night. Sir James Douglas nearly managed to capture Edward III, but was fought off. After the night raid, the standoff continued before the Scots just upped and left, and the English did not pursue. Militarily, this is a tough one, as the Scots have won on a technicality. The English deciding war with Scotland is too costly. They've been forced to negotiate the Treaty of Edinburgh-Northampton and recognise Scotland as an independent country and dropping their claims of feudal superiority over the Scottish monarchs, meaning at half-time it's Scotland 10, England 4. Welcome back to the Wars of Scottish Independence. The second half sees some substitutes as King Robert the Bruce of Scotland died in 1329, his five-year-old son David II taking the throne with his seven-year-old English wife. Donald, 8th Earl of Mar, is looking after Scotland's affair while the King is in his formative years. It doesn't take long for the Scottish and English to begin fighting again, as Edward Balliol, son of the deposed John Balliol, is challenging David II for the Scottish throne with unofficial support from Edward III of England. It's 1332 and 15,000 Scots are preparing to face 3,000 of Balliol's supporters, both Scottish and English alike. More Scots are expected to join the Earl of Mar in support of David II, so Balliol and Henry de Beaumont, 1st Baron Beaumont, are launching a surprise night attack. So confident of victory, the Earl of Mar hasn't even set up a night watch, and the Scots are, true to form, getting drunk. The English army have the Scots outflanked before the battle has even begun. The Scots cannot retreat, and in their slumbering stupor, don't have time to get themselves into any kind of defensive position. 
the front of the Scots are surging forward straight into Beaumont Spearman while the rest of the Scots are being picked off by Balliol's archers. Many Scots trying to retreat are causing a pile-up. Hundreds of soldiers are being crushed by the sheer volume. Such is the devastation the piles of Scottish bodies are stacked as high as a spear. The English are finishing off any survivors by stabbing at the piles with spears and swords. Any Scots who have escaped are being cut down by Balliol's cavalry. An absolutely devastating defeat for the Scots that claimed the lives of the Earl of Mar and Lord Robert Bruce, the late King's illegitimate son. Thousands of Scots slain, whereas Balliol's forces lost a mere 33 at the Battle of Duplin Moor. Scotland 10, England 5. I'm just getting word that a small battle has taken place in Dumfriesshire at Dornock where 800 English troops have engaged with just over 50 Scots. Needless to say, the English won, killing 24 Scots while only having two of their own killed. England 6, Scotland 10. Edward Balliol has crowned himself King of Scotland but has underestimated his support. He's been ambushed at Annan and forced to flee to England while only half-dressed. He has appealed to Edward III, promising the King of England land. The English have agreed and are heading north to join Balliol's siege of Berwick. The Scots, unsure how to resolve the situation, have unsuccessfully attempted to draw the English away by attacking Bamburgh in the northeast of England. The Scots, under the protection of Sir Archibald Douglas, know that if they don't engage with the English, Berwick will fall. Unfortunately for them, the English have occupied a strong position that the Scots will find difficult to attack, having to go downhill through a marsh, then back up to meet their foes. It's 19th July 1333 and the Battle of Halladon Hill has begun. The Scots, approaching from the front downhill, don't have to wait long before the English arrows begin falling. As soon as they try to navigate the boggy ground at the bottom of the hill, a great sleet of arrows descends, killing thousands. The slow ascent up the other side finds the Scots packed so tightly together that archers can scarcely miss their target. It's a brave fight from the Scots, but ultimately a folly as they are slaughtered trying to approach the English or run away from the aftermath of the battle. To make matters worse, Sir Archibald Douglas was among those killed, Berwick has fallen and the landowners of the area have given their fealty to Edward Balliol. Edward III of England has left Scotland to Balliol to quell any further resistance. Bannockburn has been avenged, Scotland 10, England 7. Two years have passed and Balliol still cannot keep control of Scotland. In 1335, he and Edward III of England are devastating the countryside, indiscriminately burning and maiming everyone they lay their eyes on. While the two Eddies are on their mad killing spree, the Queen of England's cousin Guy of Namur is a bit late to the party and is facing off a very angry Scottish army at the Battle of Boromir. The Moor has retreated to the ruins of Edinburgh Castle and the remainder of his retinue have barricaded themselves in by killing their horses and stacking their bodies behind the door. The Scots are being generous and telling the Moor to leave and never return. I assume the political dimension is that the Moor is French and the French are Scotland's allies. That's another point for Scotland at 11. Edward III considers his work in Scotland done. Surely Balliol can take control now that the Lowlands are subdued. The new Guardian of Scotland, Sir Andrew Murray, is off to Aberdeenshire to free Kildrummy Castle, besieged by David of Strathbogie. Strathbogie has been warned of Murray's approach and has moved south to intercept his enemy in the forest of Culblane. Murray has been joined a few miles north of the River Dee to the east of Strathbogie's position near Culblane Hill by a party of 300 men from Kildrummy, led by one John of the Craig. John's knowledge of the local countryside is proving invaluable. He's guiding Murray's force on a wide sweeping movement to the south and west in an attempt to take Strathbogie from the rear. Uer misses. Murray's element of surprise has been lost as he is spotted by enemy scouts. The Strathbogie camp are making ready. His troops are largely recruited from the local area, probably by impressment, and he appears to have no archers. Murray's force is divided in two, the forward unit being commanded by William Douglas. Seeing Strathbogie arrayed for battle, Douglas has halted, hesitating in the face of his enemy's preparedness. Strathbogie is leading his men in a downhill charge, but their ranks are beginning to break on reaching a burn. Douglas has ordered a counter charge. Sir Andrew Murray, with the rear guard, have immediately launched an assault on the enemy's exposed flank. The charge is so fierce that they're trampling all the bushes is flat. Pinned down in front and attacked from the side, Strathbogie's army has broken. They're unable to escape and refusing to surrender. Strathbogie bravely stands with his back to an oak tree and has been killed in a last stand with a small group of his followers. Scotland 12, England 7. The Scots have managed to take back control of all land and castles from English and Balliol forces returning Scotland to how it was under Robert the Bruce. 
Edward III of England is more interested in fighting France in the Hundred Years' War. King David II of Scotland is of age and has returned from exile aged 17 in 1341. He's raiding the north of England in aid of France. France have asked him to launch a full-scale invasion of the north of England and he has done so. It's 1346 and tightened for the Battle of Neville's Cross. It looks like the Scots have learned from Duplin Moor and Halidon Hill and have taken up a strong defensive position waiting for the English to attack. The English, however, are also in a strong defensive position and have time and morale on their side. They are provoking the Scots into attacking by firing arrows at their right flank. Instead of being picked off in this manner, the Scots have decided to engage, but are breaking formation due to the unfavourable terrain. The English men-at-arms are easily fighting the remaining Scots that have succeeded in reaching them. The Scottish left flank have fled at the sight of this, leaving David II and his children exposed to arrow fire. The Scots are struggling to retreat and are being routed. King David II has been hit in the face by two arrows and has been captured by the English, while managing to punch his captor so hard in the face that the Englishman lost two teeth. More than 50 Scottish barons have been captured or killed, meaning Scotland has very little military leadership left. A decisive victory for the English, taking them to eight points. Luckily for the Scots, Edward III seems less interested in invading Scotland than he does just keeping the Scots out of England. With no military leaders, there's not much the Scots can do. The Scots have been negotiating for David II's release while both sides continue their raiding of each other's borderlands. Hostilities broke out in early 1355, the English preemptively raiding Scotland, burning the lands of Patrick, Earl of March. The Earl of March is retaliating with William, Lord of Douglas. Douglas has sent a force of men to plunder and raid the country around Norham Castle, captained by Sir Thomas Grey in an attempt to goad Grey into an ambush. Douglas is calling on Grey and his garrison to come out of the castle and fight them if they think they're hard enough. Grey is rightly suspicious and has sent scouts to look for evidence of a larger Scots army in the vicinity. Douglas's men have burnt the village and stolen the livestock. Grey's scouts have returned with nothing to report. Grey is pure raging and is leading a force of men at arms to pursue the Scots and recover the stolen gear and livestock. March, meanwhile, has hidden himself and his force in the woods to the south of Duns. Douglas has abandoned the livestock and ridden north to the Earl of March to inform him of Sir Thomas Grey's imminent arrival. Grey has left the cattle to be collected later, pursuing Douglas and has led his men directly into the trap. Douglas and March's main force have cut off any chance of Grey's retreat by moving between them and the border. Grey has seen the banners of March and Douglas and chivalric honour has forbade him to escape. The Battle of Nesbit Moor has commenced. The Englishmen have rushed the Scots, but the superior Scottish numbers are quickly beginning to tell. The Scots have won the day and have taken many prisoners, losing very few of their own. Scotland 13, England 8. In a revenge attack, Edward III has burned the entire of the Lothian area of southern Scotland in what is being termed Burnt Candlemas. It's 1357 and King Edward III of England has signed the Treaty of Berwick as the final whistle blows. Scotland remains a fully independent country, having won 13 battles to England's 8. King David II of Scotland has been released for a ransom of 100,000 marks, or £67,000 in today's money, payable over 10 years. The Scots have paid the first two instalments, and King David is now embezzling his own ransom funds, making him deeply unpopular. He's also agreed to name Edward III of England his successor to the Scottish throne, but the Scottish Parliament have rejected this. David II died in 1371, age 46, and Edward III died in 1377, age 66. David was succeeded by his nephew, King Robert II, the first of the Stuart line. I'm sure Scotland will have a bright future as an independent nation under that lot.